And then I'd like to introduce Professor Michael Jung. Michael Jung is a research assistant at the University of Hanover and gained his PhD with a thesis on the history of technical university of Hanover in national socialism. He works on a research project on radicalization and nazification of an educated elite between 1899 and 1933, focused on Technical University of Hanover. He is the author of numerous publications on issues and problems of higher education and the academic and student counseling. Political and racist cleansing and nazification of a German university after 1933 on the example of Technical University of Hanover is the title of Professor Jung's paper. It focuses on a particular aspect of nazification of German society, the nazification of universities. We know that the, um, the expulsions of university teachers for racist uh, or uh, political reasons in Germany after uh, 1933 uh, reached a very large extent, but uh, the effects of these expulsions in the activities of the university are mostly unknown, especially in the activity of technical universities. Professor Jung's contribution is based, on, uh, is based on the example of the Technical University of Hanover. Please, mm. Professor yeah. Jung. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation, and uh, I am glad to be here in Pisa. And um, yes, <laughs> um, almost uh, 70 years after the end of the Nazi regime in Germany, I would like to give you an insight um, into a particularly dark chapter of German university history, which focuses uh, on the personal change of the teaching staff at the universities after 33. The main activities of the university studies, teaching and research were very much affected by the personal policy. Therefore, this contribution deals mainly with the development of the members of the most influenced state group, the professors. This group determined in National Socialism mainly the content of teaching and research, as well as the image the university projected to the outside. In this respect, a look at their development gives an insight into the development of the institutions of higher education at that time. The seizure of power, Machtergreifung uh, in German, by the National Socialists in Germany strongly influenced the universities too. Generally known are certainly the, the large-scale expulsions of university teachers for racist or political reasons. Less well known, however, both in Germany and in other countries is the Nazification of university in particular in the area of, of personal policy. Many questions remain. For example, who was appointed after 33, who was, uh, and what was the justification for this appointment? What were the effects in the activities of the universities? Here I will focus on these particular questions. The contribution is based on the example of the Technical University of Hanover, uh, the predecessor of today's Leibniz University which is in the meantime very, very well researched in terms of their personal policy. Although some very special results are quantitatively observed at this university, the basic principles of political and racist cleansing and nazification are clearly visible. Finally, I will briefly touch on the personal continu continuities after 45. First part saved as purely German university, cleansing after 33. Already in April 7, 33, so just a few weeks after the seizure of power, a law was in force which was cynically designated as law for the restoration of the professional civil service, in German Gesetz zur Wiederherstellung des Berufsbeamtentums, and the latter pro provisions of wider application followed. It offered not only the opportunity to remove, uh, to remove non-Aryan officials from the public service, but also those who were considered for different reasons as politically unpopular or, quote, 
after their previous political activities do not offer the guarantee that they will be available for the national government at any point of time without reservation, as it was called by the law. It was the basis for the beginning of cleansing of university staff. According a compilation of, uh, of 2007, yes, nearly 21% of all university teachers in the top 15 classical universities were then driven from their position in, in the years between 33 and 45. That was a number of uh, 900 persons in this 15 classical university. For technical universities, comparable percentages are expected. Displaced academics in Germany included, for example, the physics, physicists Albert Einstein, James Frank, Lise Meitner, the chemist Fritz Haber, and the social scientists Sigmund Freund and Herbert Marcuse. These are just some of the persons I would like to mention here as representative of the many persecuted. At the Technical University of Hannover, political and racist cleansing is not the defining characteristic for this particular part of their history. In fact, a total of 29 university professors retired from the service of the university between 33 and 45. This is a significant number, considering that there was at that time an average of 42 full professors in the three faculties. This is a number that today, of course, still gives rise to speculation about the reasons that may have led to the personal decisions. After a comprehensive listing in 1994 on, and this was the title of the article, the first wave of dismissals of university teachers of German universities on the basis of the just mentioned act, the Technical University of Hannover was not affected by this wave of layoffs, at least until the end of 34. No evidence of political or racist motivated dismissals can be found in the contemporary publications as well. Quote, for political and racial reasons, a member did not need to leave his function. The then rector Otto Franzius confirmed in May 34 in a speech at the handover to the of the rectorate to his successor. For the next three years, there is also no indication that for political or racist reasons, even one professor was expelled from the Technical University of Hannover. At first glance, this is a positive result. A closer look at the exit of professors shows that, in fact, all 29 university professors left the university by transfer to another university, retirement or death, except one. As the only professor of, uh, or the only full professor, Otto Flaxbart, professor of mechanics, left the service of the Technical University of Hannover due to exceptional circumstances mid-37. He did not accept a position at another university or, and also did not reach the emeritus status uh, with his 39 years of life age. Until then, he was also not noticed as a dissident. Also, Fluxbart's teaching and research, uh, research may not have been the reason for leaving the university. As an academic, he was extremely popular with the students. Nevertheless, Fluxbart was transferred on June 29, 37, to retire. As a reason, a rather nebulous passage of the law for the restoration of the professional civil service was used. Accordingly, officials could be retired, quote, to simplify the management or in the interest of the service. This position could not be restaffed, which in this case, after all, it was a very important share for a technical university, mechanic, was very surprising. Thus, the dismissal of Fluxbad remains puzzling at first glance. Only two small clues and still accessible documents are able to shed light on the issue. Fluxbad himself pointed out in a letter to the fact that his elimination took place, quote, in the wake of the rigorous persecution of the Nazi idea. And in a letter from the ministry was informed succinctly that, quote, his wife is non-Aryan. Fluxbad's wife was in fact of Jewish origin and his removal from the service corresponded to Nazi racist policy. However, the legal regulations also contained a number of exemptions 
in which concerned persons could continue in the service. For example, participation in Great War as a so-called front camper, fighter on the, at the front, or important research activity would qualify as such an exemption. It would have been easy to work towards such an exception for Fluxbart as the two mentioned criteria could also be applied to him, but the university made no attempt in this direction. And also the initiative to the procedure is started by the university. The justification for Fluxbart's retirement could only mean that his chair was considered superfluous, an assessment that was the sole responsibility of the university. And it was the university represented by the rector and corresponding dean who made the recommendations to the ministry with the aim to remove Fluxbart from service. Some dismissals from the Technical University of Hannover after 33, except Fluxbad, also involved non-civil servant university teachers. In April 33, the remaining research contract of the Jewish philosopher Theodor Lessing was withdrawn. Since the mid-twenties, he was known by the fierce criticism of the then President Hindenburg. Nationalist circles, not only at the university, hated him for it, and as a result, he lost his lectureship. 25. The action against the honorary professor Hugo Kulker, who was on leave in spring of 33, caught more internal attention than the long before 33 basically completed case of Lessing. This acknowledged expert in steel construction was supposed to be appointed to chair position at the Technical University of Hannover. However, in 32, he was highly controversial among the teachers at this university due to his Jewish origin. Kulka actually converted to the Christian faith in 1912 and totally and unsuspicious to have had unwelcome liberal or left-wing political attitude was forced to put his teaching position down in April 33 and fled to the Hague in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands. He died in October 33 due to an insufficiently treated disease when fleeing from Germany. Furthermore, the chemist and private lecturer, lecturer Günther Schiemann was excluded from the faculty of the university due to Jewish relationship. Not to forget, uh, the extraordinary uh, professor of art history Alexander Dorner and the former Ministerialrat, it's uh, like a deputy uh, director in the Prussian Ministry of Education, Richard Bolt, who both had to leave the university. Uh, unfortunately, we have no picture from Richard Bolt. If you add up all the dismissed persons, one comes to a percentage of less than 5% of all university teachers of the Technical University of Hannover. It was a number of uh, 130 uh, with uh, lecturers and so on, honorary professors. Compared with the Technical University of Braunschweig nearby Hannover, where about 30% of uh, the teachers were dismissed and the Technical University of Ber Berlin, where it affected about 23%, this number is extremely low. The above mentioned statement of the then rector Otto Franzius in his speech in May 34, quote, for political and race, racial reasons, no member needed to leave his position appears to be so far a quite accurate description of the events of the university. The reason why Francius announced in the same speech with non-concealed satisfaction, quote, the existing will, uh, existing will of the professor since the foundation of the university to save the university as a purely German university has found well-deserved recognition. This could serve a resume that describes not only the desire of the university to abide the correct nationalist orientation, as it was evident with the case of Lessing already in the 1920s, but also as a guideline for, the further, for their further personal development in the years to follow. Part two, true leaders and educators, the Nazification of the university. After all, 30 per, uh, professors were appointed to the Technical University of Hannover in the 12 years of the Thousand Years Empire, Thousand Reich in German. 
The National Socialist re regime was, of course, eager to establish appropriate junior staff in its spirit in the universities. A uniform habilitation procedure, uh, so-called Reichshabilitationsordnung, for the entire state was adopted to this end, inter alia, which provided crucial political parts for the granting of permission to teach. The, se the selection of new lecturers remained essentially under the control of the universities, even if the compulsory political training was not always be met with greatest enthusiasm. It met the demand for the right political views on the explicit consent of four seasoned and respected professors of the Technical University of Hannover. Before 33, they were working for the university for a long time. In, septem it's in September 35, as part of an appeal, they formulated that the inner attitude, the engagement and joyous affirmation of the Nazi state um, of nominees for appointment must be beyond reproach. This was a quote. <laughs> this criterion has been designated by the force in addition to the scientific training and many years of practical experience as the one, in their words, of the very greatest importance. By the way, no one of those professors were at this time member of the party. In the half of the today reconstructable 28 appointment procedures, informations of Nazi activities were included as explicit positive skills. Mind you, this was done as a part of the written statements for the appointment procedures. It can be assumed that some informal preliminary investigations were held about the suitability of potential candidates. This demonstrates some cases at the Technical University. It is clear that negative or not so positive political evaluations led to being either ignored or classified low on the appointment list. Only three of the 30 appointment procedures carried out between 33 and 45 were controversial within the university or between the university or parts of it and the ministry. So, 90% of all appointment procedures were conducted by consensus. The first major controversy occurred in connection with the filling of the three chairs of physics that were vacated in 34-35 by changing a shareholder to Breslau, today Wroclaw, and retire, retiring the two others. The two others. It is generally known that physics, at least in the beginning of the Nazi regime, was an ideologically controversial science. So it is not surprising that the ministry took the initiative to fill the three chairs. <coughs> With two of these appointments, the Chair of Experimental Physics and Technical Physics, there were no insurmountable problems. The two future professors stayed representatively at the university. One was proposed by the ministry, the other by the then rector itself. The latter, Hans Bartels, began an office as, a pro as professor of experimental physics in April 1, 35, and with breathtaking speed became dean only one month later. He then ran, equipped with power, in collaboration with the rector, parts of the faculty and student body, as well as the ministry, the appointment of the geophysicist Theodor Schlomka, geophysicist Theodor Schlomka, to associate professor of theoretical physics. This proposal was explicitly explained politically against the traditional physics. Schlomka's professorship in theoretical physics was fully enforced by the end of the year despite many dissenting opinions from the university and many unfavorable, unfavorable reviews by recognized experts. The second case was the chair of economics, which was to be reoccupied in late 37. Here, two Bartels, who, by the way, was not a member of the party, played an important role. He still held the position of, the, of dean and submitted a proposal list, which was approved by the rector and senate to the ministry. This proposal list included a certain Hans Fritz Sohns, head of the Institute for Applied Economic Research in Berlin, as first on the list, even though he had no academic degrees. Sohns' position was on the list, with bef uh, list, on the list was before two professors with, P with PhD and proven teaching qualifications, so-called Habilitation in Germany. 
This order of appointment for an economics chair, even at first glance, appeared as uh, some, uh, somewhat peculiar, required a more detailed statement that Bartels promptly provided. He summarized that, uh, quote, the problem of education has to be in the foreground in addition to academic scholarship in the teaching of economics of the technical university. He added that this is necessary to form, quote, the attitude of the technician to prepare him for his subsequent employment. Such educational task, which in Bartle's opinion, quote, dominate in such a strong way, could only be solved by a strong teaching personality. It is this assessment that led to the mentioned ranking in the proposal list. Bartle saw the fulfillment of his demands guaranteed by the appointment of Zones. By Bartle's view, Zones was an excellent practitioner who actively participated in the reorganization of economic life after 33. Thus, and by, in his words, the knowledge, uh, the knowledge of the realities of the economy enabled him to impact to, on the listeners, listeners directly and personally. It was also said of him that he was an excellent teacher. Where Zones obtained all these qualifications is also indicated in the appointment proposal. He has, quote, done practical work on economic political fields since completing his studies in economic policy office of the NSDAP in different positions. What conceals so modestly behind the practical work, it is clear from the CV of Zones. He was born as a son of Saarländer. Saarland is a province near France in the southwest of Germany, who, as Zones formulated about his father's day, died as an alleged war criminal in French military prison in Saarbrücken. Since 22, he was a member of the NSDAP. In 31, he acted as a Reichsredner, as an orator for, for the whole empire and, was, uh, and the party, and was fully employed in the service of the party leadership the Reichsleitung of the NSDAP. Through his participation in the Hitler Putsch, in English Munich Putsch, I think, uh, in 23 he was awarded the gold medal awarded by the Führer and the decoration of 11923 on ribbon, the blood order. Thus you can call Zones justifiably as 100% Nazi, as an alten Kämpfer, old fighter, par excellence. It is clear what educational tasks Bartle thought Zones could perform and what influence he would be able to exert on the students. The other candidates with their proven professional qualifications paled against such a splendid Nazi fellow. This proposal list of the dean was hotly disputed in the faculty. After all, Bartels had already gathered more faculty members behind him than two years earlier in the appointment of the chair of theoretical physics. Thus, he was supported by other professors, for example, the outgoing professor of economics, the former rector, and the seems self-evident, the professor of theoretical physics, Schlomka. This was not the majority, however, but Bartels did not rely on a majority due to the leadership principle, which gave the chiefs all the power. Nevertheless, he was not ent entirely at ease with his detailed explanation for this matter. So he transferred in the last words of his proposal the economics at the technical university quickly in a technical subject. In technology, he said, quote, the, construct the, the, the constructive performance in practice quite equal to the academic performance. Therefore, the lack of scientific work could be balanced out by Zohn's excellent praxis. Most members of the faculty committee saw this otherwise. In two second opinions, it was criticized that Zohn's never had any proof of academic achievements, and therefore no appropriate assessment of his academic qualifications would be possible. And secondly, universities should not deviate from the applicable principle of the connection between research and teaching, which was adhered to also at the technical university. A professorial expert formulated that Zones could, quote, not at all be referred to as an economist. 
In fact, zones could not measure up professionally with the other candidates on the proposal list. The two other candidates had publication lists that filled one or even more than one page. They both had, the PhD, had PhD degrees and the right to teach. Zones had none of these qualifications. Despite all this, the proposal list was sent to the ministry in October 37. After less than one month, it asked the faculty to command on whether the proposed zones could show relevant academic experience as required by the Civil Service Act. Only then could he be appointed. This law came into force in early 1937. The corresponding article demanded imperative for a tenure, among other things, that he, quote, has completed the prescribed or usual preparations for the position or sample service and passed the prescribed or usual checks or the transferred office has conducted for five years. The usual roles for university teachers were laid down in the Reichshabilitationsordnung. Common and also prescribed, therefore, were doctoral, postdoctoral, and granting of permission to teach. Zones was not able to prove any of this and was therefore not able to take over the chair. While the ministry insists in, this metic in the meticulous compliance with the law in this case, which did, did not necessarily belong to the essence of Nazi regime, can only be speculated about. Conceivable are uh, intrigues under different management levels of party and government apparatus, but also, and this seems to be key, legitimate concerns about the future functioning, <coughs> about the future functioning and lowering of the scientific standards at the technical universities. You know, two years later we had uh, had the war. Anyway, finally, another member of the party with the required qualifications was awarded to cha uh, the chair, and no one from the proposal list was hired. A third, a third contentious case was closed with a satisfactory compromise that involved everyone. The example of the selection or a procedure of the Department of Economics may be taken as evidence that the university parts well, the university or parts of it must have never been a toy of interest for the ministry or other higher level offices in regards to their personal policy, but certainly they were in a position to represent their interests and enforce them. Indeed, that there was an obvious and strong agreement between the ministry and the university to fill the chair position proves many consensual decisions. Only three of the 30 procedures were contentious and only in one the ministry prevailed with opposing the majority of the university. Therefore, it cannot be a question of that the university was under strong pressure in the selection of its teaching staff. The university teachers that were hired were those the university wanted in general due to their technical but also political qualifications. In general, this can be said for other German universities as well. Thus, nearly 90% of the new profs between 33 and 45 were members of Nazi uh, organizations and 77% of full professors uh, of, the uni, of the technical university, of all full professors, not only the new, new ones. Third part, continuities. It's the last part, <laughs> and short. The dismissed Schiemann and Fluxbert were able to return to the university after 45. Kulka had died during the escape. Lessing was murdered by Nazis in late August 33 in his exile in Czechoslovakia. Donna and Wold um, worked at senior positions in the US and in Dresden in the German Democratic Republic. At other German universities, many, but not all, displaced university teachers returned to their old or new position for various reasons. Of the then 40, in 1945, uh, of the then 40 full professors, 10 were discharged from the British military government in the months after surrender of the surrender of Nazi Germany due to the extent of their involvement in Nazism. However, all were able to return to their positions, not later than by the beginning of the 50s. 
even when the persecuted and discharged Fluxbart, 47 to 51, served as rector of the university, it provided a closer look at the, look at the past of the then 16 rectors between 45 to 70. More than two-thirds were active in Nazi organizations, most notably the party. Now, this fact is not so, uh, surprising in itself if you know that in the end there were more than 10 million Germans who were members of the Nazi party. So it was certainly not easy to find people who were entirely unencumbered for leadership positions. Thus, this fact is not a criticism itself, but rather the way of dealing with the past. Professors were dismissed, they came back, and, um, oh, moment. <laughs> Professors were dismissed, they came back, and new university teachers were appointed without seriously discussing their or the university's past. Such discussions were scrupulously avoided for decades at the Technical University of Hannover as well as in all other German universities. In the late 60s, several classical universities began with the first work up. Most technical universities are still behind in dealing with this part of the history and some have not even taken care about the time between 33 and 45. For a long time, this was also the case for my university, the Leibniz University. However, on a positive note, recent serious efforts have been made in this regard by the Leibniz University of Hannover. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Jung.